Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being with me this afternoon. I first want to introduce to you, if you don't know, Brian Haas, our state attorney. I think simply the very best state attorney any place in the nation. And then we have Assistant Chief of Police in Lakeland, Sammy Taylor, who's with us today as well. Both of them will speak. And I do want to point out for those that may say, well, where's the chief? He's home with COVID and he's quarantining and he offered to come to work and uh, the two assistant chiefs said, do us a favor, chief, stay home and get well. We also have Major Chris Colson and my chief of staff today, Steve Lester with us. Now, I'm going to take a few minutes to outline what we know at this point in the investigation. I'm going to recap some of what we talked about this morning, but I need to underscore it now for everyone that this event started about 4.23 this morning. We gave our first briefing early this morning, and this is the second one, certainly in like 10 hours. Anything I say is subject to modification or correction at a later time, but as is the policy here in the 10th Judicial Circuit, we always provide all the information that we can as soon as we can so the community will know what we know. It's likely that some of the details that I give you today will change as the investigation and the crime scene work goes forward. And it's also important to note that there's some information that we cannot validate yet and or details that we will determine later. But we do have a lot of information to release concerning the suspect. Before I start the chronological series of events, I want to tell you clearly and unequivocally that at this point in the investigation, we find zero connection between our shooter, our murderer, and our victims. He lives in Brandon. And I will explain that later, but I wanted to clear, say that clearly because the first thing you will ask F after hearing this information, well, certainly there had to be some connection. We find zero connection at this point in the investigation. So here's what occurred. About 7.23 Saturday evening, we received a call of a suspicious person and vehicle on Socrum Loop Road in the unincorporated area of North Lakeland. It's kind of a mix of rural and suburban area. Nice community, wonderful people. We arrived within six minutes. And when we arrived, the suspect was gone. The witness told us that he pulled up and said words to the effect that God sent me here to speak with one of your daughters, Amber. And so they said, nope, no one here by the name of Amber. I'll give you the chronology later on by another person, person's version, but at that point in time, the suspect wouldn't leave and he stopped on the side of the road where he saw a guy mowing. So the guy mowing went and got another person, and when I have to talk about another person, understand that we have Marcy's Law in the state of Florida, so unless victims give you the, uh, the permission or victims' relatives gives you permission, you cannot identify who they are. So the our victim, who I will discuss in a few minutes ago, that that told us that we could talk to him, goes and gets this other person, and they go, what do you want here? Well, I'm here to talk to Amber. You see, God sent me here because she's going to commit suicide. So this other person reconfirmed, there's no Amber here. You leave her, we're going to call law enforcement. And they did, and he left, and we arrived. We spent 22 minutes at the scene and in the area looking for this vehicle and it was nowhere to be found. Nine hours later, Lieutenant Tompkins, who is patrol lieutenant in the Northwest District, is in the area of Highway 98 North and Duff Road 
and he hears two bursts of what he believes to be automatic gunfire. He notifies communications. He immediately grabs all of his available deputies, and they start to the area. He doesn't even know where the gunfire is coming from other than it's to his north and to his east from where he is. Almost immediately, the sheriff's office began getting 911 calls of an active shooter. Now, we have a protocol in place at the sheriff's office, and we partner with all, all of our police departments and our state police. When we send out an active shooter call, everyone comes. And that's what occurred on this particular occasion. At about 4.22 this morning, whenever we notified everyone that there was an active shooter, our deputies were coming from not only the Northwest District, but other districts of the county. The Lakeland Police Department, who's our partner and our colleague and a professional police agency and, and our dear friends, of course, they sent us everybody they had. So we started rushing a lot of people to the scene quickly. So Lieutenant Tompkins arrives at the scene, and when he arrives at the scene, there's a truck on fire in the front yard, and there's popping sounds from the truck. And he immediately noticed there's these glow sticks kind of in a path from the road up past the residence as if it's creating a path. And at that particular time, he notices and, and his colleagues notice that there's a guy in camo outside. They did not see a firearm, and he ran back into the house. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in that particular area, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning before you may be getting up, going into the woods, that's not totally unexpected dress if it weren't for the gunfire. But he, they see no guns. He runs into, the suspect runs into the house. And then there's another volley of gunshots. And they could hear a woman screaming and a baby whimpering. At that point, Lieutenant Tompkins and his team attempt to make entry through the front door. And it's blocked. They go around to the back door. Lieutenant Tompkins goes into or, or forces his way into the house and is immediately confronted with this same person who now is wearing bulletproof vest, camo, knee protection, head protection, and there's a shootout. The suspect shoots at our deputy, our lieutenant, and our lieutenant shoots back as we know now apparently striking him. He retreats back into the house. The lieutenant retreats back. We set up a perimeter. At that time, the suspect starts shooting toward our deputies from inside the house. We begin to lay down directive fire so that we can get three deputies to a safe location who have been pinned down by the gunshots. All of this time, our colleagues from the police department are arriving. In fact, one of our colleagues from the Lakeland Police Department actually got there in time to help send directed fire back toward the house from which we were being shot. So now our deputies are shooting. Lakeland Police has a officer that's shooting and everything goes silent. We have air support there, and air support notices a guy coming out of the house, notifies the perimeter units, and he's got his hands up. He surrenders, and it's our suspect. When he surrenders, now we're hailing into the house and we find out there's a, an 11 year old female victim who is calling back to us. She's significantly injured. And Sergeant Graham, once again, another hero that was there that night, rushed into the house 
and rescued the 11 year old who had multiple gunshot wounds. I'll give you this preliminary number, it's subject to change. We don't know how many of them are entrance and exits, but she has at least seven bullet holes that we've counted. Immediately, she was transported to Tampa General Hospital. Tampa General Hospital is simply the greatest trauma unit you can find any place in the nation. It's about 35 miles away, and because she was a juvenile trauma patient, that's where the protocols say that she went, and she couldn't be in better hands. In the meantime, we've got the suspect in custody. He's injured. He goes into a Lakeland police car. The Lakeland police car drives him to the perimeter where fire and rescue, fire rescue, Polk Fire Rescue is staging. They put him on an ambulance and rush him to the Lakeland Trauma Center for help. On the way, according to the Lakeland police officers, while on the way to the hospital and while at the hospital, he made statements like he'd been taking methamphetamine. Of course, there are people across the state and nation that think that's a low-level, nonviolent drug. Well, they couldn't be more wrong. I've got empirical evidence to the contrary. I wish that they would quit saying that publicly, and I wish the politicians would quit paying attention to it, because taking him at his word and face value this drug is anything but low-level and nonviolent. He also said that he was a survivalist. And he said statements like, you know why I did this. So we worked to secure the scene. We were significantly concerned about booby traps because it was evident to us that with him laying out this pathway for us, he wanted to draw us into an ambush. So it took a period of time for us to deal with that issue. The 11-year-old little girl, when questioning her, made the statement that there's three more people in the house who are dead. And they were. So let me stop there for a minute and go over what we know about the people in the house. The suspect, first and foremost, is Brian Riley. He's 33 years of age. Brian went into the house and he shot and killed number one victim who gave us permission to release his name, Justice Gleason. Justice is 40 years of age. Then he shot, and in, this is in no specific order. Our victim number two is a white female who does, whose family doesn't want her name released. She's 33 years of age. Victim number three is a white male that's three months old. I went into the crime scene and saw victim two, the 33-year-old white female, holding this infant in her arms and then both deceased. Then there is another small apartment or house behind this house, to the west of this house. The suspect had gone in there and shot and killed victim number four, who was a mother and the grandmother to the infant. She is 62 years of age. And of course, I told you about the white female, victim five that was 11. She is a student, as I'm told, at Lake Gibson Middle School. She has undergone surgery. I don't know if she's still in surgery at this hour. She's certainly expected to recover, and we thank God for that. But in addition to that, if he's not evil enough, he shot and killed the family dog. And if the ironies aren't horrible enough, this is one more bit of 
horrible irony. The dog's name was D.O.G. And the dog was named after one of our canines that was shot and killed in the line of duty along with the canine handler in 2005. So let me tell you about Brian Riley, the information we know at this time. He was a Marine. He did four years of service and was honorably discharged and did another three years in the reserve. He was deployed to Iraq in 2008, Afghanistan during 2009, 2010, and he, during that period of time, was designated as a sharpshooter. He's currently employed by ESS Global Corporation in executive protection as a bodyguard and to provide security. We located his girlfriend, who was absolutely, totally cooperative. And she said she had been dating him approximately four years. She said he had PTSD. I've seen him depressed. I've never seen him violent. She said, but a week ago today, meaning last Sunday, he did security at a church in Orlando. And he came home and he said, you know, God spoke to him. And now he can talk directly to God. And she said, I'd never seen that kind of behavior. She said, but once again, he wasn't violent. And then later in the week, he said that God told him to go to the hurricane relief and to take supplies. So all through the week, he was buying supplies so that he could make a trip to provide hurricane relief from Hurricane Ida. She said he came home on one day, he, became, he was becoming more erratic, he wasn't sleeping at night, and he bought $1,000 worth of cigars to take as a relief present. And he said that God said that he should do that. So he came home Saturday evening and said, he saw a man on a lawnmower, and God gave him this vision that his daughter, Amber, was going to commit suicide. So he told this man that I need to talk to your daughter, Amber, that she's going to commit suicide. God told me. And the guy said, hey, there's no one here by the name of Amber. But he was insistent. The guy told him to leave. But he was insistent. So the guy who we believe is victim one, we're not absolutely 100% confirmed with this, but we believe our victim one, Justice, he goes and gets another witness, which is one of our victims. She comes to talk to him, and he's... And they said, look, buddy, there's no Amber here. You need to leave or we're calling law enforcement. That's when at about 7.23, our deputy arrives. We spend like 22 minutes there looking for him, and he's gone. Well, what we didn't know at the time is he had left and gone back to Brandon. And when he gets back to Brandon... He talks to his girlfriend and he says, oh, before he goes back to Brandon, he tells them, look, you don't need to call the cops because I'm the cops for God. They tell him, you leave or we're going to call the cops. So 7.30ish, 7.20, he leaves. Now we know that we didn't know this morning he went back to Brandon and talked to his girlfriend. She said, look, you're not talking to God directly. He gets mad and said, there's no room for doubters in my life. God gave me a gift, and I'm talking directly with God. 
She says, we've never had an argument like this. He didn't threaten anybody. She said, so he went to his man cave and I went to bed. I woke up at 6.30 this morning and he was gone. So I turned on my GPS and saw that his cell phone, and we know his vehicle, was on Socrum Loop Road. They began to get news reports. So she grabbed his father and the father's wife and came, met us, and talked to us. We also know that Brian has a concealed weapons license. But this is Brian. He has virtually no criminal history. Virtually none. Back when he was a teenager, he had a small charge and then just almost nothing. So we're not dealing with a traditional criminal here. But what we're dealing with is someone who obviously had mental health issues at least this last week, had PTSD, and whether or not we follow that back to the military, we don't know. As he's interviewing with us, he's trying to convince us that he's mentally ill, but he's very in tune with his statements and his admissions. But he says at one point to our detectives, they begged for their lives and I killed them anyway. He's evil in the flesh. He was a rabid animal. Our hearts and our prayers go out to the family of those that are injured and uh, injured and deceased. It's just a blessing from the good Lord that during the shootout and the subsequent volleys of shootouts that my deputies and our colleagues from, or a colleague from Lakeland Police Department weren't shot and killed as well. The crime scene will take hours and hours and hours and days on a cursory look, we identified at least two and maybe three firearms. We see different calibers of shell casings from ammunition inside. They're literally, they are just beginning the crime scene investigation at this point. I want to introduce to you our, our state attorney who once again, as I said before, I believe is simply the very best and I'm honored that he would come out and be with us today and personally direct the prosecution piece of this investigation as our shooter Brian Riley has been treated at the hospital and released and now is in custody in this building while we process the paperwork. Mr. Haas. Thank you, Sheriff. I guess the, the big question that all of us have is why. I know that's the thing that's been on my mind the whole day. And uh, unfortunately and so um, frustrating that we will not know the why today maybe ever, but we do know that a lot of folks have been uh, terribly impacted. Our community um, has been a victim of this terrible tragedy and the family members of those who have been killed. It is incredible, given what I saw at the scene, that no law enforcement officers uh, were, were injured or killed, and it just highlights the dangers that our law enforcement officers uh, are put themselves in harm's way every single day, every single night, and it's incredible that we don't have more victims based on the weapons and what we saw at the scene. So obviously this begins and continues a very long process that I imagine will, will go on for some time to come. Uh, once the arrest is officially made and the court system will then have the case, 
Uh, we will provide updates as we can, but this we expect will go on for quite some time. Thank you. And I've also asked if Assistant Chief Taylor would speak on behalf of the Lakeland Police Department and their response to assist us, for which, Chief, I'm, I'm very thankful that you all were there and did a wonderful job with us. Thank you, Sheriff. <clears throat> on behalf of the men and women of the Lakeland Police Department, I'll, I'll be brief in my comments, but I do want to uh, reinforce what, uh, what Mr. Haas and the Sheriff have said about the heroic actions of the officers and the deputies out there. Um, and I've used the word horrific before when I've spoken to you on other cases, but I can tell you the scene out there is absolutely horrific. And it would have been more horrific if we'd have had deputies or police officers injured, and by the grace of God, I don't know how they weren't. I mean, the, the, the deputy, the lieutenant engaged in a firefight right in the doorway, the back door, you know, he chose to make a heroic entry into that house, and then we have other deputies that were willing to run towards the gunfire. So I can't, <clears throat> I can't compliment the heroic actions of those, uh, those folks that were at the scene. Um, the fact that the uh, that no one was injured more than than what if we had no deputies or, or police officers injured is is uh, by the grace of God. I don't know how it didn't happen. So I want to compliment those guys. We do have one officer with the Lakeland Police Department that did return fire. Obviously, he'll be out on uh, paid administrative leave, which is which is normal. Um, and then the other two officers that were there from our agency uh, or will be returning to duty tonight uh, if they feel like it. So. Again, thank you for coming out, and thank you to uh, the Sheriff's Office for doing a tremendous job on this. As Sheriff said, there's a lot of work that still has to be done. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, they're going to be out there the rest of the day and maybe into the next several days working on this scene. So, but thank you for coming out. Can you get the name of your officer and provide support? We'll provide that to you later, yeah. Yes. Yeah, the suspect's name is Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, Riley, R-I-L-E-Y. -E Brian is 33 years of age, and our, and our victim is Justice, J-U-S-T-I-C-E, Gleason, G-L-E-A-S-O-N. He's 40 years of age. Are there any other questions for Mr. Haas or... Well, he's, play, he's trying to play games with word games with the detectives, which is a clear indicator that he knew exactly what he was doing. He hasn't. He just explained that they begged for their life and that he shot and killed them anyway. And the, the, the interesting thing, and we don't know the answer to that, and I underscore we don't, and as Mr. Haas said, we may never know. How did he end up at that house? And he lived in Brandon, and then he was able to find him way, himself a way back to that same house nine hours later. His girlfriend said he made zero statements about being violent or dangerous to those people at that residence. It simply appears at the early stage, and this is of the investigation, and this is conjecture, and it certainly can change. As but he just happened to be the unlucky one mowing the yard, and that's where Brian stopped that day. But if there's more information, if, because we're sitting here with the same questions that you are, and everyone is in the community, is why there? This is not near his home. He has no relationship that we're aware of to any of them, and we can't answer that at this time. And the 60, the 60 she's, she's the of both kids, uh, she, this, the 62-year-old, we can't give all of the relationship. Well, we can tell you that, yes, they're related. We just, according to Marcy's law, can't release information that would lead to the identity of any of the victims. Justice told us we could use his name or we wouldn't be able to use his name. We have no idea at this point in the investigation and we may never know that. But once again, we've not been able to have any detailed conversation with our 11 year old victim who Sergeant Graham heroically rescued from the house. She couldn't walk from the house. She was too injured and he ran in there and rescued her. And I, I hate to ask this question. You can ask anything. Mm -hmm. but, um, where were the victims shot, especially? 
Yeah, we're not going to release where the victims were shot, and quite frankly, I don't know where all they were shot at this early stage, but we wouldn't anyway, but they were, they were shot significantly to immediately pass away. We, it's all conjecture. We don't know. We think some of them sh were shot before we were there. When we got there and he saw us and he ran back inside, we didn't see any guns. And we heard another volley of shots, and that's when we heard the woman scream and the baby. And, one, and then we tried to enter, and that's when we had the, the one of our uh, volleys of gunfights with him and, and apparently shot him on that particular occasion. But once again, he had bulletproof vest on and was guarded up. Then we didn't hear any other shots that we heard past that point were as they were coming out toward us. We don't know when he shot the lady in the apartment behind the house. I, my conjecture at this point is before we arrived, but I, you know, but we don't know at this po point in the investigation. We may never know. We just know we had a madman with a lot of guns that shot and killed innocent people. How were the uh, officers and deputies uh, when the uh, SWAT team came back to the staging area? They definitely had a sad look on their face, and sort of a not, not entirely sort of a sad look. How was that? Well, once it's important to understand, we train law enforcement officers to be their best at the worst of times, and that's what our law enforcement officers were last night. They were their best at the worst of times. But anytime someone dies, it's tragic. But when you see somebody so heartless, so calculated, that they will shoot a mother clinging to her three-month-old baby and kill the baby and shoot the family dog, this guy is heartless and calculated with his murder. He had all kinds of opportunity to change, and it's all, once again, conjecture and speculation, but he laid down these glow sticks from the road up past the initial house, up behind the house. I think, at, and the preliminary information, he was trying to create a diversion or an illusion or, or create an opportunity for these deputies to follow these glow sticks and see what would happen. And at the same time, keep in mind that the truck's on fire and it's popping and crackling and burning. So you had got the division, diversion there. The deputies have already heard volleys of gunshots. Now they're seeing glow sticks. And this thing, this thing is deteriorating around them very rapidly. And as my colleagues here said, how we ended up not with a lot of deputies and police officers shot and killed is just absolutely amazing, but for, but for their training. The, the, do, the girlfriend was shocked. She said, I didn't know of any drug use. And our statements are based upon his statements. And Pete, uh, he said he had PTSD and did he get back there at all? Don't know. That's just what we were told. Were there any drugs found in his vehicle? Or we, will, we were partnering with the Hillsborough Sheriff's Office to execute a search warrant at his residence. His girlfriend is totally cooperative with us in that endeavor. She is as mortified and shocked as I believe all of us are. She said she didn't see this coming, or obviously she would have done something about it. Can you say how many guns he had? You said there was a lot of guns. We, we know that there's at least two, possibly three guns in the house. From a cursory look, we've not executed our search warrant and done our complete crime scene. Will we find more than that? I don't know. Two, possibly three in the house. Our, t our victims 
we have a total of five victims. The 11 year old, which is alive, and four that are deceased, plus the canine DOG is shot and deceased as well, the family dog. There was another 10 year old little girl that we were looking for because it was the sister of the 11 year old. We found her alive and well at family, at another family's house. No survivors. He shot everybody in the house. Was the 10-year-old in the house or ran out? The 10-year-old the was never there at all. We just knew that there was a sister that was unaccounted for. She was never there. She was at a relative the whole time. She, had, she was not involved in it in any way. I don't think it'd be appropriate to talk about where we found them at this point in time, but we can tell you that they were huddling and hiding in fear. The guns, uh, the gun that was used, or the guns that were used, are, are, I know you mentioned rapid fire, things like that. Were, were these high power rapid fire types? Yes, they, they were, and we will obviously be doing further analysis. I anticipate once the crime scene work is complete, We'll probably have an update and wrap up this information and hopefully be able to show you the firearms at that point in time. So we have, to my knowledge, at least two people in the last 10 months who are mentally ill, who have gone in and just slaughtered people. What is the solution to this? Well, first and foremost, when I was asked if, if you didn't hear the question, that we've got, had two people in the last 10 months that, that where the mentally ill people have gone in and slaughtered them. It's important to underscore just because you have mental health problems does not mean you're not criminally liable. He's criminally liable. He played word games with us during the interviews to try to set a defense. That doesn't work. But at the end of the day, when you look, this guy prior to this morning was a war hero. He fought for his country in Afghanistan and Iraq. He was a decorated military veteran. And this morning he's a cold calculated murderer whose girlfriend of about four years, it's not like she's just known him a month or two, said that, yeah, we've noticed that, you know, that occasionally he has a little depression in their words, PTSD from the war. But the reality of it is this nation doesn't do enough for those that are mentally ill. Now, there are millions that have mental health episodes that don't do this. So because people have trouble with their mental illness doesn't mean they're going to be a mass murderer. This was a mass shooting. This was an active shooter event. But my goodness, as horrible as it is, we see mass shooters at theaters and at churches and at schools and at businesses. But who would ever think in a community with a 49-year crime low that you would have a mass shooter at 4.30 on a Sunday morning in a quiet, safe neighborhood? And it's evident when you look at his lack of criminal history. So when we're dealing with these active shooters, these active assailants, these are not traditional criminals. Criminals are criminals. They're thugs. They'll steal. They'll use drugs and take your stuff. But a normal, what I call run-of-the-mill, garden-variety patch thug and criminal is not a mass murderer. This guy was a mass murderer. My response would be that 
that would be conjecture at best. It would could be folly or fantasy that because there was no communications at this point in the investigation that tied this conduct to our last couple of weeks in Afghanistan. But what we do know is we have a guy who was becoming delusional and his girlfriend said he progressively got worse as the week went on but still he wasn't being violent according to her or threatening any violence. No, I, and quite frankly, I don't know at this moment in time, but he was treated and released. So, and it might have been that the injury struck him via his bulletproof vest that he was wearing. I just don't have that information at this point in time, but he was treated and released. He also, as, as I said earlier, while in the hospital, went from being calm to jumping up and trying to grab one of the Lakeland police officer's pistols who was gracious enough to work security on him while we were still at the scene and the Lakeland police officer had to fight with him in the emergency room. Well, you know, I've done this job my entire adult life, and I've seen a lot of tragedy and a lot of sadness. And there's things you can't unsee. I will never be able to unsee that mother with that deceased infant in her arms as they both lay there dead. It is a horror of the utmost magnitude. So. I have seen other horrible events before. This ranks in the top 10, top five, maybe top three. It is, it's sad when anyone dies at the hands of a murderer. This man's evil in the flesh. It was total, total unprovoked mass murder and there's not enough adjectives or descriptives to point out how angry I am with him or how sad I am for the family and anything I said would certainly anything appropriate to say certainly is not fit for television or social media and I've said some pretty pretty outlandish things before and to keep from going down the path about how I really feel, I should say nothing. What kind of dog is it? Big dog. Big family dog. I don't know. I saw it. Deceased. It was a very, very large family dog. But I don't know what kind it was. It was it wasn't evident to me from looking at it what kind what what breed it was. Anything else? Sheriff, uh, you said that they had uh, reported that they did call law enforcement when they saw him in the neighborhood. Uh, can, you, can you just kind of touch on how important it is for community to, to point out stuff like that? And to, to follow that question, then I would say, did you guys, how long did you stay in the area and did you guys leave a deputy around the area or can you even do that you have manpower yeah it's first off we were there 22 minutes it's not like we stopped and they said where is he he's gone and we left we were there 22 minutes we it's a saturday night we get not tens not hundreds but thousands of reports of suspicious people suspicious vehicles so to suggest at that moment in time that we've got time to stop and do an investigation on every suspicious person and vehicle is, um, is not possible. And there was no reason to think that. When he came the first time, other than talking irrational, he made zero threats to anyone, according to the information we're provided. Zero threats. He was just a guy that was saying some really goofy stuff 
Well, newsflash, people say really goofy stuff hundreds of times a day that we're made aware of and thousands of times in this state and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of times a day across this country. We can't do a full-fledged investigation every time somebody says something goofy. You know, the irony of, of this is this county is 2,000 square miles. We have a population of 720,000 people, over 2,000 square miles. This county is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. The fact that we happen to have a deputy close enough to hear the gunfire is, was remarkable in and of itself. Our response was quick, and our backup from the police department was quick, and we engaged quick. It just wasn't quick enough. And once again, when we saw the guy in his camos and he ran back into the house, at that point in time, we didn't see a gun. I don't have any information to lead us. So you can't just have a policy of shooting people in the front yard that's wearing camo, but my goodness, all good old boys, you know, that hunt and fish and Polk County wear camo. And 4.30 in the morning, that's, that's not unusual. They're getting up, going out to fish. So in and of itself, there was nothing suspicious there initially other than the gunfire. But we didn't see a gun. And as you well know, you can't engage someone who's running away from you when you don't see a gun and see a, an um, imminent threat. And none of those presented, I can assure you, our folks were well trained. Had we had the legal opportunity with no alternative to talk him down, we would have shot him a lot. But that wasn't the circumstance that presented itself. And our deputies professionally did what they should have done. And they took him into custody when he came out with his hands up with no gun. Now, as this investigation rolls out, we'll, we'll bring you more information that we know. And we're certain that social media will be wide open. And if you don't like the version of facts as we know them, you can see some crazy stuff on social media. Whether you choose to report it, it's up to you because we've already heard that he said, that she said, that he said, that she said, and all kinds of stuff that to our investigation didn't occur. Just people surmising what they think might have happened. So you know basically what we know at this point in the investigation other than the logistics of questions like where were they shot that we're not talking about. Okay? Thank you very much. Have a good day.